deal or no deal. Bob Johnson was still caught in record labels, but nobody wanted to know. Most thought the two openly gay frontmen were a bit too hot to handle. Despite what liberated times we thought we were living in, there were still plenty of people out there who were pretty hostile and unenlightened about people being openly gay. The Hope and Anchor video was gaining a little reputation for itself, and why not? Who wouldn't want to watch girls in leather writhing around to a heavy backbeat? It was looking like I was going to see out the term of my apprenticeship with the council. We were losing a little heart and couldn't understand why nobody was going for it. We thought that given the proper promotion and record company that we definitely had the beans to become pop stars. February 1983 would see another piece of the Frankie Jigsaw fall into place when a copy of the now legendary Hope and Anchor video turned up at the offices of the Tube in Newcastle. The Tube was a new show from Time Tees TV and was broadcast live from a studio in Newcastle. Everyone was buzzing about it since it exploded onto our screens on the 5th of November 1982. It was hosted by Jules Holland and Paula Yates and had an anarchic and ragged quality to it, but there was nothing ragged about the sound of the bands on the show. The bands appeared and always sounded decent, and you could tell the guys behind the scenes had a passion for what they were doing and were interested in showcasing good bands and not just bands who were being touted by the mainstream music industry. It was always exciting to hear something new, and the tube played a big part in launching many previously unknowns. What follows is what I was told. It may be true. It may be truth that's been embroidered slightly to sound a little more entertaining, but I think it illustrates perfectly how much luck has to do with any successful band's career. Talent has very little to do with it. Coincidences, flukes and the old school tie have more to do with commercial success than talent, musicianship and good songs. I wouldn't want to diminish the burning flame of ambition of any budding musician, but from most of the stories I've heard and read, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. Our appearance on the tube was all down to the Hope and Anchor video being in the right place at the right time. Bob had sent a copy of the video to the tube, and apparently it was sitting on a desk of Mick Sawyer, who was planning a trip to Liverpool to cover the local music scene, which had the likes of Echo and the Bunnymen and the Teardrop Explodes at its vanguard. Mick picks up the tape, looks at the accompanying band biography and sees that we're from Liverpool. He puts the VHS in the machine and likes what he sees and thinks it would be great and right up the tube Strasse to record a similar video of the leather-clad freaks somewhere in their hometown. Phone calls are made, cameras are packed and the Geordies headed south to Merseyside. We were going to be filmed miming to the original demo of Relax that was recorded at Gateway and the cameraman were going to get their money's worth out of the leather pets over the elongated drum intro. The venue for the filming was to be the State in Dale Street. The State was an opulent Art Nouveau ballroom that had opened in the 1920s and is now a listed building. It had reopened in 1982 and had become the venue of choice for people my age that had previously graced the dance floors of Cagney's and the Harrington. It had decent lights and a good sound system, although it did tend to be a bit boomy due to the abundance of hard reflective surfaces, but the thing that set the state apart from other venues was it had lasers. By today's standards, it wasn't very impressive, but it was new back then and the high ceilings of the state were perfectly suited to the lasers' little green dance. In the month following our performance there, I remember being stoned and blown away after hearing New Order's Blue Monday for the first time, whilst the lasers were flying above my head. Steve Proctor was resident DJ on Thursday night, and we were always in there. I think Steve had some involvement with the tube filming in the state because he had promoted gigs there before. You can see this performance on YouTube and compare the tube's version with the original Hope and Anchor one. We performed and looked our freakish best, and the girls swung around on the brass poles that comprised the venue's ornate lights. I've just stopped recording to look at it again. 28 years has not diminished my embarrassment at what a complete twat I looked. I could have got a job as an extra in cruising and been cast as the one with the really bad haystack haircut stuffed under his patent leather disco cap. Leather waistcoat and chaps, bullet belt and shades. Shocking stuff. I think it'll be another 28 years before I look at it again. The Leather Pets got more than their fair share of camera time, and maybe this is what really attracted Trevor Horn to Frankie and made him look up from his curry and rice down at Sam West. 
He was recording the Yes album 90125 at the time of transmission and he later told us that it was routine that everyone downed tools and sat down to eat some grub and see what was on the tube on a Friday night. He'd heard our Peel session and this had planted the name in his head but seeing us in the flesh and there was a lot of flesh to see was the point where he decided that Frankie Goes to Hollywood were going to be the first band on his new label Zang Tum Tum. We were in the right place at the right time. The wheels on the bus to Hollywood took their first revolution on the evening of the 18th of February, 1983. I already had one TV appearance under my belt, but there was a huge difference between appearing for five minutes on a local news programme and being seen across the nation on a dedicated music show. In football parlance, it was akin to gaining two promotions in one season. It would be another appearance on the tube just before Christmas of that year that would be instrumental in turning round the chart fortune of our debut single. But more of that later. We haven't even got a deal yet. The appearance on the tube would open another door and get us another radio session, but this time it was an earlier time slot with the slightly more mainstream David Kidd Jensen, which meant another trip down to Maida Vale to record four more songs. We recorded The Only Star in Heaven, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, Relax and Invade My Heart, the latter being a remnant of Holly's time playing with Steve Lovell and was more of a Holly composition than a Frankie one, but I think we liked playing it and it was catchy, but it was a little more lightweight than most of the current set. This new version of Relax had the shooter in the right direction middle part and the edit now to the clunky time signature change featuring In Heaven Everything Is Fine was definitely beneficial. Without the interruption, the track drove along more and the groove was a little bit meatier. Trevor Horn heard this session also, and his interest increased to the point where Bob was contacted, and we went to see Trevor and his wife and label boss Jill Sinclair, and an offer was made. The deal offered was to record one single. If that went well, they could take up an option to musically incarcerate us for the rest of our short career. Hmm, what's the money like? Shite. A £500 advance payment to split between you and £30 a week. You'd be given £10 a day extra if you needed in the studio. I was earning four times that working for the Corby and I was only turning up for three days. How many points? Good percentages. You get 13% but Trevor takes 5% of that back for producing it. So that's 8% for the UK and 6% for the rest of the world. Well, I suppose we can always get a good advance from a publishing company. No. They want the publishing as well. It's a deal breaker. No publishing rights, no deal. So, let me get this right. They're committing themselves to record and release one single for a shabby percentage, but they want to own the publishing to all of our other songs. Hmm. Is there an advance on the publishing? Yes, another 500 quid. Knock yourself out. Where will we record our pop single, and how much will we have to spend making it? You'll record the single in their studio at a time length of their discretion and you'll be paying top money for the studio time. In fact, you'll be paying more than anyone else who uses their studio. In fact, everything from equipment hire to the chef's curry and rice will be getting charged back to you and you'll wear it because you've no bargaining position because no one else is interested. Have we seen a lawyer? What does he think? Yes, we have. He thinks it's a pile of shite, but it's the only pile of shite on the table. Hmm... We signed it. We'd taken legal advice and our newly appointed lawyer, David Gentle, had told us in no uncertain terms that it was shite, but we signed it anyway. We didn't know it at the time, but we were signing on the last page of what would become a legal landmark contract in the music industry five or six years down the line. My wildest dream is becoming real. I'm being offered a new job as a professional musician. The post looked like an initial commitment of six months and wages that wouldn't cover the cost of a night out in the state, but I would be a professional musician. What if we turn it down? Will there be another offer from elsewhere? What if we do this record and nothing happens? What if we don't do this record? Would the band survive six months treading water in Liverpool? All I'd ever wanted to do since I first saw David Bowie was run away and join the rock and roll circus, but there didn't seem to be a big chance of a secure tenure in the ring. To be fair, it looked like a great circus to run away with. We had the ringmaster supreme to produce our record, and we knew he was capable of real magic when it came to putting the animals through the hoops. 
We were all aware of Trevor's reputation and we loved his records, from ABC to Dollar and Duck Rock, and we were aware that this guy could really bring the magic to the recordings and give them that shiny gloss of production that we all admired. We could fail, but there was a chance we could shine. That's why we signed it. Do I regret it? Fuck no. If I'd have known what was about to happen to us in the next four years, I would have signed it in blood from the stump that was left after giving them my right arm. Who gives a fuck about the points in the deal? Realistically, we're arguing about percentages of nothing. Let's make it hit record. How'd you do that? Hmm. <laughs>